Um, so we have a great panel to start for you guys today. Uh, something that we're probably all really concerned about and want to talk a lot about. Um, the, the, the talk is called Brazil Redo, Redux, Short Circuiting Tech Enabled Dystopia with the Right to Repair. Uh, so please give a big hand to these guys uh, for coming here today. And let me hand it over to Paul. All right. Hey everybody, thanks for, uh, thanks for showing up early. My name is Paul Roberts. I'm the uh, founder of Secure Repairs, which is a group of information security, information technology professionals who support the right to repair. And um, we're here today to talk about right to repair. And um, the first thing I uh, wanna do is to, you know, clarify why uh, the title of the, uh, the talk is Brazil, because um, Brazil is uh, something that actually the movie Brazil, something that sort of has a lot of tie-ins with our talk. So I'm going to play a clip from the 1980 film, 1985 film, Brazil. What are you doing? Harry Tuttle, heating engineer at your service. Tuttle? Are you from Central Services? <laughs> I called Central Services. Well, they're a little overworked these days. Luckily, I intercepted your call. You did? Just a minute. What was that business with the gun? Just, just a precaution, sir. Just a precaution. I've had traps set to me before now. And there are plenty of people in Central Services who'd love to get their hands on Harry Tuttle. <laughs> are you telling me that this is illegal? Yes and no. Officially, only central service operators are supposed to touch the stuff. Would you hold this, please? I, but nowadays, with all the new rules and regulations, they can't get this in staff anymore. So they tend to turn a blind eye, as long as I'm careful. Like, mind you, if ever they can prove that I've been working on their equipment. <laughs> well, now that's a pipe of a different color. <laughs> but wouldn't it be simpler just to, you know, work for me, please? Sorry, yes. I was saying, wouldn't it be simpler to work for central services? Ah, ah, couldn't stand the pay. You couldn't what? Couldn't stand the what? Paperwork. Couldn't stand the paperwork. Listen, this whole system of yours could be on fire, and I couldn't even turn on a kitchen tap without filling out a 27 B stroke six. Bloody paperwork. <laughs> I suppose one has to expect a certain amount. Why? I came into this game for the action, the excitement. Go anywhere, travel light, get in, get out, wherever there's trouble, a man alone. Now they got the whole country sectioned off. You can't make a move without a form. Okay, um, so Brazil is a movie about a dystopian future in which um, central services, a repair organization run by the state, basically controls uh, everything. And if you want to get your, in this case, air conditioner repaired, you have to go through central services. And Harry Tuttle is kind of a rogue repairman who like repels down the sides of buildings and swoops into people's apartments to do rogue repairs. Um, and the whole movie kind of hinges on trying to catch Harry Tuttle and a whole bunch of stuff that happened as a result of the state trying to um, arrest him and stop him for doing what he's doing. Um, so the, the big picture of this uh, panel is to talk about how Brazil is our current our present is a lot closer to the future imagined in Brazil um, than you might think. And we've got an amazing panel here um, to talk about that. Um, the goals of the panel, to get you informed uh, as a community. I think the DEF CON community is really important um, in this struggle. Uh, to get you engaged in this problem, because some of you might kind of know a little bit about right to repair, but you're going to know a lot more by the time we're done. Um, and hopefully to get you involved, because we need people involved to get this done as a society and as an economy. Um, and so what I'd like to do, oh, sorry, is um, fool around with PowerPoint and make you watch me. Um, no, what I'd like to do is, um, first of all, introduce our panel. Um, and uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. My window skills are terrible at this point. Um, here we go. Um, so uh, why, don't, why don't we do that? So um, if I can just figure out, yeah, there we go. 
Sorry. Um, I'm going to go down the. Um, I'm going to go down our table and, and let each of them introduce themselves to you and say hello, and um, then we've got some discussing to do. I'll start with you, Corinne. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Corinne McSherry, and I'm the legal director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Woo. Woo. I'm Kyle Weens, and I started iFixit. I've been involved with Right to Repair for, for a good while now. I'm Lewis Rossman. I have a repair shop in New York City that does component level repair on Apple products, and I have a YouTube channel where I make an enemy of lobbyists professionally. My name is Joe Grand, also known as Kingpin, and I'm a hardware hacker, and this is definitely the most serious panel I've ever been on, <laughs> uh, but very important as well, so thanks for being here. Um, I'm really excited to have all of them, and I'm very thankful that they you know, took time away from their busy lives to, to come and talk to you about this. Um, so I think um, to start, probably a good place to start would be with the problem. And um, so, so why do we need to have this talk? Why is there even a question about our right to repair stuff? Because we own it, right? Um, and I thought to start, I'd just sort of toss that to Corinne, because I think you're the lawyer on the panel, and you're the best suited to talk to us about this. If I have a thing like, a, let, let's say I'm an Xbox uh, owner, PlayStation owner, and some discrete component on my Xbox or PlayStation breaks, um, why can't I just repair it? What's standing in my way? Why is that a legal issue? Let me count the ways. Um, okay, so let me say first that I, I, this, is, this is the conversation where like, I'm really sorry that the lawyers are showing up. And you know if the lawyers are showing up, it's probably not good, probably not. And when it comes to repair, that is very, very true. Um, so do you wanna hit my slides or should I just- Oh, yeah. sure, sorry. It's all right, but I'll just get, I'll get started. So, so the, the key problem is that if there's software in your thing, in your device, in your refrigerator, in your car, in anything that makes it smart also makes it a copyrighted work. That software is going to be a copyrighted work very likely and with copyright comes problems. Um, so yeah, so if software then copyright. Okay, so what are the different problems? Can do the next one. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so if copy, copyright comes with restrictions. The reason you have a copyright is you can then license the work and it gives you a lot of control over how that work is used, how that software is used. Now there's limits on that, like fair use with, and a lot of other limits. It's not unlimited, un, unlike what many copyright owners think, but still, it comes with restrictions. So as a practical matter, that looks like problems for repair. So the first thing is end user license agreements. So very often you will buy a device, and again, by device, think car, think refrigerator, not just your phone, right? And you own the thing, but the software in it is licensed to you. And somewhere along the line, you're gonna, something's gonna pop up and you're gonna agree to it because everyone does, as everyone knows, no one will read it, but it will be a thing. And it will have a limit, it will have all kinds of limits on how you can interact with the software in your device. Now, as a practical matter, People often ignore these rules, and that's not the end of the world. But if you are a third party and you are helping somebody ignore those rules I, by providing some kind of interoperable service or something like that, well, then they can sue you for interfering with that contract because that license agreement is a contract whether or not you read it. The law on this is terrible. Um, so that's a problem, and if you think those lawsuits won't happen, they already have happened. That's a thing that chills everybody. So for example, this is sort of a classic example, but there's a million of them. Um, so the Xbox EULA says you can't modify it, e.g. through unauthorized repairs or unauthorized upgrades or downloads. Okay, so it's like, you know, we want to be in charge of how you use the thing. So that's problem one. Problem two, often that software is going to be locked down with some kind of DRM. I think probably people in this room are very familiar with this problem, but just quickly, at this point, they weren't 10 years ago when we started talking about it, but people know about it now. So if, if you've got a lock on the software and you break it, which is often trivially easy to do, so you can get access to that software and mess with it, well then you have engaged in an act of circumvention very likely. And if you tell people what you did, you have now trafficked 
you engage in trafficking, and both of those things are illegal under Section 1201 of the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So that's further limits. It doesn't matter if you're doing it for an otherwise lawful purpose, to be clear. You could be engaged. Reverse engineering, for the most part, is a fair use. It is protected. You're allowed to do it. But the DMCA will stop you, even, if, again, if it's a very trivially easy lock to break. Okay, lastly, other, and this really is the most irritating thing, basic stuff. Maybe you just want to have access to a manual. Maybe somebody might like to take that manual and scan it and make it available online so people could use it more easily, compare different manuals, just get access to it. You could use a search and you can find the right thing that you need and not try to flip through. Maybe you don't have your manual anymore. Might be somebody in this panel who, who wants to do those very, could be I don't know. Person. So just one second, let me just work it through. Um, so the manufacturers very often will claim those manuals are copyrighted and they have gone after people for posting them online. Or they'll claim that they have they involve trade secrets. Now this isn't the manual that is made necessarily available to um, the consumer, but rather the manuals that they make available to their authorized repair people. And they will say that is, even if they make it available to thousands of people, they will say it's still confidential business information because we only share it with them subject to an NDA. So I'm very sorry to have to be here. But I am glad to tell you that now I've told you the bad news, but there is good news, and we will talk about that next. Thank you. Um, there is good news indeed, and the good news really is the, the right to repair movement. And um, on the panel, we have what I consider kind of the prime mover of the right to repair movement, who, which is Kyle Weens um, of iFixit, who not only started iFixit, which is of course just a huge and valuable resource for people who want to do repair, um, but has also really helped promote uh, right to repair laws in the states, not only actually in the states, but actually in, in the EU as well. Um, and so Kyle, I thought I'd toss it to you to kind of give us the TLDR on right to repair laws and what are they, what do they try and do, um, and why are they important? Sounds great. Mind if I click through myself? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> All right. So we have been working on this. Uh, I like to say I've been tilting at this particular windmill for a while now. Um, f fundamentally, we, we need to find a way to kind of reset expectations back to where things used to be. Um, and so that's why I started I fix it in the first place. We've built a open source repository of repair information with the, uh, the goal of attempting uh, to enable everybody to repair all their things. Uh, but there's a lot of problems with that. Um, and, and so let me tell you about a buddy of mine, Tim Hicks, uh, who we really need to get here sometime. Tim would be awesome. But Tim is in Australia. It's a, it's a bit of a walk to get here. Uh, Tim runs a very creatively named website called Tim's Laptop Repair Manuals. And on it, he posts service manuals from all kinds of different things. And uh, of course, he, he, gets, uh, he is the, facing the brunt of the issue that Corinne describes. So this is a letter that Toshiba sent him. They said, hey, on your website, we can see that you're distributing by download copyright repair manuals that are proprietary to Toshiba. These are only available to Toshiba authorized service providers under strict confidentiality agreements. Ooh. This is this is where I, I like it. They're like, you are not a Toshiba authorized service provider. <laughs> Okay, no duh. Thanks, guys. Um, so Tim, uh, in response to this, you know, Tim, he's just a kid running the website. He, he went ahead and took the manuals offline. And we decided, like, this cannot stand. This is ridiculous. And so we launched Operation Fix Toshiba. Uh, and we crowdsourced. We went out on GoFundMe. We said, hey, guys, we need, like, $10,000 to buy one of every laptop that got taken offline. We were buying them used. And, uh, and then we disassembled all of them. We wrote new open source service manuals. We put them online. And then in the process, we decided we would make Toshiba a new logo. <laughs> Which I think they were super thrilled about. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of, you know, we're chipping away at this around the edges. There's a, there's a variety of challenges that we're running into. Uh, one problem that we see with all kinds of gizmos, you say, well, why do you need the service manual? Because this stuff is crazy glued together. Um, th anyone here have the original AirPods? Raise your hand. Bought the original AirPods. Okay. Now, keep your hand up if they still work. Mm. We got like one. Okay, very impressive. Think different. <laughs> the guy who didn't use his AirPods very much. Th these, You've taken these, them out of the box. So... 
these gizmos have like the moment you glue in a battery to a device, you're like you're attaching a death clock to it. It's absolutely insane. I mean, it, it, the way that we buy gadgets today is like if you bought cars and the tires were welded to the frame. It's like when the tires wear out, just buy a new car. No one would put up with that, but we put up with this for electronics, and it's not okay. Uh, and uh, so we we. I, is I, I started doing the, you know, like we're just gonna write our own repair manuals and we wrote lots of manuals. Uh, we were, you know, creating everything ourselves, Creative Commons um, and our, our cameras and it, we just got really tired. <laughs> We'd been doing it over and over. Our community has written 75,000 repair guides. We're gonna keep going. We're not gonna stop. But every year at CES, manufacturers introduce like 15,000 new gadgets. It's very hard to keep up. So we have to bring manufacturers into the ecosystem. And, and then when you get into the world of embedded software, we need access to schematics. We need access, um, we, we need to be able to legally, you know, bypass DRM. So that's where we've started working on right to repair legislation. Uh, we've gone to the powers that be, <laughs> and it turns out some of them agree with us, which is pretty cool. So we went to the Federal Trade Commission uh, uh, a couple years ago and said, hey, what's the deal with those warranty void if removed stickers that we see everywhere? And I think we're all here, we like breaking rules, and I've seen people walking around here with, you know, I void warranty t-shirts. Cool, but why is it voiding warranty if you disassemble a thing? It turns out, it isn't. Uh, I guess we could ask the lawyer, is it legal? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. go for it, break the warranty. So it turns out there's a law that says it's perfectly fine to open stuff up and it does, if you remove a sticker that says warranty void if removed, it doesn't actually void the warranty. And the Federal Trade Commission has asked all of us, if you see those stickers, to send them pictures to reportfraud.ftc.gov. <laughs> So if, if you, I mean, you're welcome to send it to the FTC directly. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the FTC has launched, uh, 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 they just reached a settlement with Weber Grills and Harley Davidson where the terms of their warranty were explicitly banning people's right to tinker. And then uh, what's crazy is just this week, the state of Wisconsin where Harley Davidson has built the AG of Wisconsin is suing Harley D Davidson for screwing over their customers and voiding their warranties. Uh, this kind of hits home for me because my dad was actually a Harley Davidson dealer. So I, I know a little bit about this world and I think it's, I think Harley Davidson has it coming. Um, so we're going beyond that and we're working on actual legislation that will, that will enshrine the right to repair. And, and I've been working on this with, with Lewis and Paul and Corinne and we've all been, you know, <laughs> uh, it has been a journey. We're up to the point where this year, 25 different states introduced right to repair laws. And I have here a little bit of a grid of where we're at. Um, uh, Nevada, I don't think is on this list. Someone was asking me last night where we're at with Nevada. Someone who lives here is welcome to get Nevada on the list. Died in committee. Yeah, we had it last year and then, and then it died. It didn't get reintroduced this year. Uh, this is a slog. We're trying to do this in parallel across all of these. But the thing is, all of you in the security research world knows, you try, a, you t attack on a, on a number of different fronts. You really only need to get root once, right? We don't have to get it on all of these. We just need to win one of these things. Because what right to repair laws say is, if you make a product and you're gonna sell it in this state, you have to make service manuals available online for free. You have to sell parts online. You have to make the tools available online. Once one state passes this, we're going to get right to repair uh, for the world. Um, and uh, fortunately, um, we think we've got that in New York right now. Uh, so the New York State, uh, and this is thanks in, in uh, much part to, to Lewis, who's been in New York on the ground, uh, going to Albany regularly. Uh, New York, it has passed the House, it has passed the Senate, and it is uh, sitting on the governor's desk waiting for her to sign it. We're hopeful she will sign it any day now. This is huge. The New York law applies to all products that have electronics in them that are not agriculture equipment, motor vehicle, a medical device, and cost more than ten dollars. Home appliances. Home appliances. We we didn't get home appliances included. We'll get that next time. Uh, but that's a pretty broad swath, right? That's most of the things that we deal with. That's satellite uplinks. That's uh, a, a boats. <laughs> there's, a, there's a large number of products that, that are included in this. Um, uh, so it'll be very very interesting to see 
how this how this goes and how we can uh, you know take advantage of this. We're hopeful that we will see more states pass this. In addition to New York, we also going back to this slide. We also got a uh, electric wheelchair right to repair bill passed in Colorado uh, this year, and that one has been signed. So that's exciting. And that's, that's really important. Unfortunately, we're at like exactly opposite a medical right to repair panel that's happening right now. And there's some doctors talking and we were just before this panel, we were talking about how like, if you have an electric wheelchair and you want to change the traction control settings, it's hidden behind the service password that they don't give the owners. Uh, and bypassing that service password, uh, do I need to consult a lawyer before I bypass the service password? <laughs> Actually, don't, don't ask. <laughs> don't ask, don't tell. Just I'm telling you, just do it. She'll, she'll have a more nuanced answer. Yeah. <laughs> this is how to make Corinne feel awkward. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so we're super jazzed. I want to mention, uh, for, I know there's a lot of international folks. This is an international movement. The European Parliament has, has been on board with this as well. Um, so there, there's a lot of momentum happening, uh, but we still have a long way to go. I mean, we, we are in a Brazil-style dystopia now. We're trying to get to a world where, where maybe stickers like this are, uh, <laughs> are not the law of the land. I think these stickers are so insidious because they, they're like, I mean, all of us are here because we like breaking rules. Uh, most people follow rules. And so when you have a rule that's on every device, like people tend to follow it. I, I, do, I do repair workshops where we'll give a kid a tool and we'll say, hey, do you want to take apart this iPod? And they look at me like I'm crazy because the rules, their teachers, their parents, everyone in society has been telling them, don't take that thing apart. Where does that come from? Where does this desire to be sheeple and follow these rules? I swear it's these rules printed on every single thing. So getting rid of these stickers is going to be huge. I, I want to mention one other thing about John Deere, and there's going to be a John Deere session at five o'clock today. Which track? You, you know? This one. Okay. Here at five o'clock today, epic John Deere news. You have to be here. It will be much more technically in depth. Uh, it's going to be awesome. Uh, I have been kind of fighting John Deere for a while. They don't like me very much. Uh, along with, with EFF and others, we applied for an exemption to Section 1201 of copyright. We ap uh, applied for the ability for tractors to be, a, or for farmers to be able to legally fix tractors. And I wrote this article in Wired Magazine about how they were saying, you don't really own your tractor. And then John Deere sent this letter to all their dealers telling them that I was a liar, which was kind of awesome. And in it, they said, uh, similar to a car or computer, ownership of equipment does not include the right to copy, modify, or distribute software that is embedded in that equipment. And, and their example here is perfect. A purchaser may own a book, but he or she does not have a right to copy the book, to modify the book, or to distribute unauthorized copies to others. Do you want to comment on that? You could totally do all of those things. <laughs> So I mean, these people are living in a totally different world. They're like, you buy a tractor and you don't own the software on the tractor. You have an implied right to operate the software. Like what? This is, this is nonsense. So uh, we need to take back our right to tinker. And that's, that's what I'm super jazzed, excited to be here with everybody here today to talk about. Thank you, Kyle. Hey, <clears throat> hey, hey Paul. Yes. I just want to yes, make a comment about this sort of like, from the, from the hacker world, you know, like what these kind of heavy handed tactics that we're seeing from mostly consumer product vendors, like this is not new for most of us, right? Like if you've ever found some sort of vulnerability and you've reported that to a company and they try to squelch you or they sue you or they threaten to sue you, this has been going on for 30, 40 years of people trying to, yes. trying to enlighten companies about problems, right? So. The thing that's important about this is it's not just sort of security related hackers, it's the mainstream everything. It's every company is gonna see what one company's tactics are and say, oh, that works, we're gonna do that also. We're gonna prevent people from modifying something, which then ends up coming back to us because it's gonna make it harder for us. And what you'll also mention is, and as you'll see, is like these lobbyists are basically going up anti right to repair saying, kind of blaming the reason why we can't repair our stuff on security which effectively is like, you know, giving us a bad name, right? Giving hackers a bad name, which we've also had to deal with forever. So none of these issues are really new. It's just they've gotten bigger and broader and most people believe them, just like the sticker. Like I had no idea that you couldn't actually take the sticker off because people, which of course I do, but people, most people don't. And if you have something that you've paid money for, you would like to assume you own it, but then you see something like that, you're like, I don't want to avoid my warranty like that. I don't want to get in trouble. 
Um, so yeah, we're kind of like pawns in this thing as the lobbyists and as these corporations are using us as hackers and us as researchers and us as end users to gain their kind of political advantage and their legal advantage, which is like total crap. Corinne. Yeah, I just want to, I would be remiss, I just the um, John Deere reference uh, reminded me of something that I meant to mention earlier that's also hopefully good news, which is, um, so the John Deere, that whole letter came up in the context of us applying, applying for exemptions from Section 1201 of the DMCA, which you, every three years you can go hat in hand to the Copyright Office and say, please, please, can I do this thing? Um, and this is ridiculous. It's stupid. And we've been fighting that at EFF for 20 years. And next month, we have a hearing before the DC Court of Appeals in our challenge on behalf of Matt Green and Bunny Wang, challenging that whole law. And if we win, we at least get rid of that piece. So, fingers crossed. Indeed, yeah. That would be huge. Okay, so the question is why at DEF CON? And I think one of the reasons that I wanted to bring this to this conference is that cybersecurity actually figures pretty prominently in the debate, both pro and con, on right to repair. I founded Secure Repairs because I was told, Nathan Proctor at US Perg told me, listen, we're in these hearings with you know, legislators on right to repair laws. And what we're hearing from the opponents is cyber hackers. You know, uh, one lobbyist told Nebraska lawmakers that if you pass this right to repair law, Nebraska will become a mecca for hackers. You know, they're gonna move to this state just so they can hack stuff. Um, and so I thought I'd, I'd, but that's not all, I mean, so cybersecurity is a big part of it. And I thought just to give you kind of a flavor of what we hear, Lewis has gone around to hearings all over the country, Kyle and I as well, Joe's, uh, testified on behalf of Right to Repair, um, give you a sense or a flavor of the arguments um, that we hear uh, from the other side. So um, if you don't mind, we're going to just take a journey down the um, anti-Right to Repair rabbit hole here. Has anybody here ever seen a magtrometer explode? Point out, it's interesting, this whole discussion I think underscores the evolution in the notion of ownership uh, that we're seeing in the economy right now. Um, you know, it used to be before software uh, was embedded in these devices, ownership was very cut and dried. You owned it uh, or you didn't. But now with software, that has become a little bit more complicated. And then another twist, and I think this is true of a lot of the folks in this room, uh, now we have services. Uh, so the combination of hardware, of software, and services is an interesting mix. And I think it does... Um, put some of these topics or issues into the gray area. Okay, so the, the first idea is on the part of the OEMs, ownership is complicated, and by that they mean you actually don't own this stuff, uh, you're, you're licensing it. I mean, you might own the hardware, but you're licensing the software, and therefore we still have a seat at the table. Um, really common. Uh, that was from the Nixing the Fix conference that the FTC ran, sorry, in uh, 2019. Um, here's the other argument, which is, that security and repairability are actually in tension with each other. That if you want to make something repairable, kind of by definition, um, you're not going to make it securable. Forcing repair on third parties like enterprise customers and manufacturers can make security worse and not better for all of us. And here's how. First is the loss of accountability for security. It's difficult to hold OEMs accountable for security of their products if we also legislate design changes that will negatively impact security. Second is the risk of backsliding the security progress that we've made. So consumers have plenty of choices in the marketplace and they can choose some manufacturers that prioritize security and others that prioritize repairability. But there's no reason that legislation should mandate repairability and take away consumer choice between repairability and security. This is a I wish this guy would show up to DEF CON. <laughs> cool to have him on our panel. So that's Dr. Earl Crane, who is a PhD and I think is like an adjunct professor or teaches somewhere. But he was for this uh, group called the Security Innovation Center that I think still exists. It was basically a lobbying front group. It's an paid for, turf. Yeah, it was an astroturf group of security experts who, you know, support, I don't know, what do they call Responsible repair or something like that. Um, he showed up to a bunch of hearings, including that FTC hearing, but he's kind of, that whole group's kind of gone on the down low. The, the um, manufacturers tend to hire experts, so they show up and do stuff like this, and then I think they realize that they're going to be on stage at DEF CON saying stupid shit like that, yeah. and they quit. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
so we had uh, Secure Repairs had Gary McGraw on the same panel as Earl, and um, that was great. Um, okay. Uh, third idea, um, just a whole bunch, just a word salad of scary sounding cyber stuff. This is if you are changing out any component at the hardware level uh, with another piece of hardware, you're not able to provide the same level of assurance that something else didn't happen. Uh, so that's the first key piece of that. What does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> right. What does that mean? Uh, the second one is there, it's a fundamental rule of security that the, the, the best security is that, like with a crypto algorithm, that it's open to the public. It's open for inspection. Good crypto algorithms are those that are open for the public and for inspection. Agreed. What's not okay is when you open up the signing keys, the secrets inside. And the challenge has been that in the uh, 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 repair conversation, it has not been articulated enough. We haven't had enough of a security discussion in here to make clear uh, what will be mandated to be uh, uh, released and where the overreach is. Uh. Okay. So as you can tell, he, he kind of got lost in the woods near the end of that because he was, he was uh, pretty, pretty far removed from what right to repair is about. Okay, and the final one, uh, well actually, yeah, the final, arg final argument you hear a lot um, is this idea about source code and intellectual property. Oh, sorry. My name is Daniel Carson and I represent Schmidt Equipment Incorporated. Our dealership represents John Deere Construction Equipment However, to the extent that the owner has the right to lawfully repair his or her equipment, John Deere recommends against unauthorized modification of the embedded software code. Providing access to the source code would not only undermine the manufacturer's innovation and intellectual property rights, would also risk data privacy and allow unauthorized and illegal tampering, illegal tampering of safety and emissions requirements for the equipment. Okay. Um, so, so that's that's kind of a taste of what I think we're we're up against um, in the right to repair movement. Um, and so, I thought um, we'd start first of all with the the person on the panel who actually is most involved in like the in just the the trenches of repair, and that's Lewis, um, who does this for a living. And I mean, I guess Lewis, could you talk to like some of the arguments that you heard there about? this, you know, cybersecurity risk in repair and, you know, whether, you know, the work that you do as a repair professional really poses a cybersecurity risk to your customers or, or to the public. The one question that I've had at every single one of these hearings is, can you provide one single example? I mean, this is, you know, repair is a $4 billion industry per year, so surely you should be able to give one example of one time anything like this has happened. Usually they can't, but I can. So for instance, when they say that independents may be able to hack into your data and do bad things, I point out how in June of 2021, there was an article released on how somebody who had sent a phone to Apple wound up having uh, their sex tape uploaded not only to Facebook, but to their Facebook because the person logged into their Facebook so it would look like they were uploading their own sex tape. That happened at Apple, not at us. Or in 2019 when the Washington Post showed that this one horny person at the Genius Bar was texting himself raunchy photos from that customer's phone. Happened at the Genius Bar, not here. There are a number of examples of things like this happening and there's this idea that there's this magical human being that exists, this you know, magic Soviet man that you get when you go to Authorized Repair Center where they've just magically screened out creeps and weirdos and anybody that's going to do anything like that. You'd think with, with the industry being as large as it is that you'd be able to find a single example of us doing something like that and yet you can't. Um, some of the, ex the other arguments that wind up getting used is just typically safety and security. So for instance, in Massachusetts in 2020, there was a ballot initiative for right to repair for motor vehicles. And they would have commercials where you'd have a woman in a parking lot, always with the really scary blue fluorescent lights, and there'd be some string music playing in the background, and somebody walking very slowly behind her. And then you'd kind of have it go to a crescendo, right? As he's, his hand shows up on the screen as if he's about to knock her out. Because if your mechanic is able to get an error code from your car, 
apparently you're going to be sexually assaulted in a parking lot. Or there was another one where you'd have a, um, a man in a flannel shirt, because that's how you know the guy's a creep, walking up on somebody's garage really slowly, this yeah. flannel shirt getting slowly into focus so you could see all the green and the black in there, and he's walking into her garage because that's what happens when you get access to an error code in a car. Has anybody here ever seen a magtrometer explode before? Show of hands. That's because it doesn't exist. But Aham was telling people that if appliance technicians work on your devices in your home, that a magtrometer, which doesn't exist, is going to explode. It's called a magnetron. It's in a microwave and they don't explode. The people that make these arguments don't even know what the names of the gear inside of them are. The scariest argument for me came from Catherine at the ESA in 2020, where she said that if this gets implemented, the game will play the console, which I think is the scariest one of them all. <laughs> But this is the level of knowledge that we're dealing with. And at the end of the day, they, the most frustrating part is listening to these arguments, realizing you have 90 seconds to get your point across, they get, to, they get their point across afterwards, and you don't get to say anything. Right. Oh, actually, my, one of my personal favorite was a person named Charlie Brown from CTA who represents Samsung. He showed up and said, we have a network of authorized people to make sure that, you know, when you get your phone fixed, you don't have TikTok installed on it. Well, three months ago on the budget series Samsung phones, they now pre-install TikTok whether you like it or not. So many of the things that they wind up accusing us of are not only things that they're doing, but things that they're getting in trouble for in the news for doing, and they never seem to face any sort of accountability or responsibility for it. If I make things up, then I'm going to get a one-star Yelp review. I'm going to get a chargeback. My store is going to close. They get to make things up on a regular basis and make $100,000 to $400,000 a year to do it. And for some reason, people believe them. So those are some of the arguments that I hear, and there's a... My, Actually, one more, my personal favorite, 2015. This is the one that actually got me started in this because I'm not a political professional or lobbyist or anything. One of the assembly people in New York State said that the Apple lobbyist had said that when I replace a fuse on a MacBook motherboard, that what I've done is I've now converted it into a PC because I changed the fuse. And when I give it back to my customer, I'm still letting them think it's a MacBook when in reality it's a PC. That's fraud. And if, so if you want to prevent fraud, you won't let Lewis get access to that through this bill. I just stared at him. I'm, I'm trying my best not to just fume and curse him out because he's my assembly person and I don't want to get audited again. And I'm just thinking about it. I said, why did you believe this horse shit? And he says, nobody else came here to tell me otherwise. Now you did. And he actually signed and co-sponsored the bill right in front of me. And that got me to realize, you know, from, there are all these people that think there's no point to bothering. Why would I call my assembly person or senator? Why would I say anything? And the reality is the reason these people win is nobody else shows up. And um, yeah, I mean, one of the big one of the big lies, that, which is the same lie that your car dealership tells you, right, is that you know their their repair people are walking around in lab coats with PhDs, and the you know the corner garage are you know criminals and never do wells. When in fact, you know you get excellent quality from the corner garage more often than not, and you get good quality from the authorized repair provider. And and that's a great example of you know Apple talking about their authorized repair as if these people are all highly highly vetted. And what we learned actually only through a lawsuit um, was that in fact Apple just outsources their um, uh, device repair when you ship a device out to a company that actually outsourced it to a third company uh, where these you know obviously not very well vetted employees stole images and posted them. Um, Lewis, I mean maybe if you could just talk about the restrictions on your business for repair. Like what are some of the hurdles that you need to get over? I know there's one just around you have parts that might you might have to order from um, China, replacement screens. They might be original Apple parts, um, but they're getting seized at the border um, because they're they're being declared counterfeit and and some of the some of those types of things. Yeah, so one of the largest problems that I'm facing right now is let's just get by a show. How many people have had a device, they plug it in to charge it and it dies? Okay, common problems. Let's say you have a $3,000 device that does that. What would you guess the repair price for that is? Yeah, so yell out, any guesses? 500. Close? Close? It's about 15 is 1500 to $1,700. And the chip that winds up dying is about $5 uh, from Texas Instruments. Now, when that particular chip dies, you used to be able to just buy this chip. You could buy it from a Texas Instruments reseller or an Intersil reseller, go to Mouser, DigiKey, Newark, and spend five bucks, buy it, and then bring it to any one of the smorgasbord of repair shops. Some charge 75, some charge 400, some charge 200, and they would all be competing in the market for your business. Now, what they do is they tell Intersil, they tell Texas Instruments, don't sell this basic chip to anybody but us. So they'll take a, uh, they'll take a chip, that is a basic normal function. They'll modify it in one small way, like what address it communicates on, so now you can't buy the off-the-shelf chip. 
and then they will make the chip that they slightly modify not available to anybody else. So what we will have to do is wait for some, wait for donor boards to come from China. So what people will do is they will take these boards that are being thrown away because they're defective and that are about to get recycled and we will, we will buy them. Now, five years ago, Apple started to get a little bit smart about that. So they started searching people as they're leaving the facility and they started shredding up all the devices that they throw away. So now you can't buy a donor board to get that chip anymore. I have to, you, you know, they have to, they sneak it out in their underwear. Like, there'll, there'll be a wing, a breast, a thigh. It'll look, it'll look like, it, it'll, you'll get a, like a little box of bits and pieces of board. And you have to see if the chip is on there that you need to put it on the board to be able to fix it for a customer. And uh, the people that are making this stuff available, I imagine, are not exactly doing it in the most legal of ways. So when I explain this to senators, I'll say, you know, I signed up to be a nerd, a device repair person. I wasn't trying to be Nicolas Cage's character from Lord of War, running guns all around the world for it, but that's what it feels like. When you hear your supplier say, yeah, the reason we're cutting these things up is because they have to sneak it out in their underwear before it comes to you. I mean, obviously the first thing I did is I dropped the donor board in front of me and I went to wash my hands. But this is part of the process. Right. Or let's say the schematic diagram. That winds up getting taken from somebody when, you know, their computer is free and somebody walks in the room all like and uh, plugs in a USB and then sneaks out and then makes it available to all of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, you used to have repair manuals written on the back of the device. Now you, and you can't get access to this even if you're an authorized repair center. Yeah. So if I get authorized by any of these companies, I still can't buy those chips. I still can't buy those manuals even if I'm willing to pay and go through all of their vetting process. Yeah, Joe, you talked about that as well. Yeah, just kind of the, the talk about that. Oh, the, go ahead. oh, I just wanted to comment on your thing about, uh, you know, vendors trying to make off-the-shelf components inaccessible to small companies, which is, which just reminded me, so I'm working on, and you might even have something to say about this, I'm working on a project right now, so extracting, you know, raw NAND flash from a MacBook motherboard, and we take it off, standard footprint, looks like any other regular type of memory device, but it turns out that Apple has worked with Toshiba to actually change the pinout in such a way that all of the available sockets and interfaces don't work with it. So there's, there's stuff you can buy in China on AliExpress and different sockets that have pins coming up to touch on different pads of a standard chip. That doesn't work. So you have to manufacture or create all your own custom stuff just to read a pinout. Functionally, it's exactly the same, but they've changed that pinout for no other reason, I believe, other than to make it impossible to get the parts other than from donor boards and for somebody like me to actually get the contents off to do something with it, which, is, which I'd never even experienced that before. Have you seen that on, most on other Mac? I mean, the, the most insidious part of this is that they don't actually even offer these services that they would be competing with you on. So let's say that you'd be offering data recovery services yeah. and they make it impossible for you to do it. Right. If Warren Buffett walks in there and says, here's $100 million, try to get my stuff and it's a basic problem, they say no. Yeah. Yeah. And they just make it hard. So now it's like what would have been an easy problem to help somebody with is now like a multi-month process that you have to buy donor boards and test it and build circuit boards to interface with other stuff and like... It's, it's almost a lot of times, you know, security we know is, is kind of how hard is, is something and is it worth the adversary from doing? And I think a lot of these tactics are just to slow us down to be like, it's not worth the effort. So then they just kind of get their way with it. Yeah, I think, I think some of this conversation is we're concerned about the repair monopoly and, and they're screwing over the independent repair shops to, you know, get monopolized repairs. That's certainly what John Deere is doing. What I think Apple is doing is it's a flat out war on repair. They don't want this stuff fixed by anyone, including Apple folks. They, it's, it's, a, it's a cycle of disposability. The AirPods were never designed to be serviced by Apple or anyone else. They're designed, you, you buy it, uh, you use it for 18 months, and then you go back and you hand them another $179. That's what they want. Right. And, and actually, right to repair laws are sort of silent on that. If you want to make a product like the iPods that are not repairable or serviceable, you know, knock yourself out. Presumably, that would be, it would fall to consumers to sort of put pressure on manufacturers to. Consumers and Europe is working. France has rolled out a repairability label where it rates products from zero to 10 on how fixable it is. It's right next to the price. Right. And that's starting to have an impact. I mean, Joe, you talk a little bit about just the concept of jailbreaking devices, because I, I kind of feel like this is this is sort of the future, which is, you know, I, I would love a future in which it's sort of like, hey, thanks for the hardware, John Deere, this is a really nice tractor, I'm now going to load my own OS on it, right, and my own services, I'm going to keep my data and sending it instead of sending them to your cloud to monetize, and but great job on the tractor, you know, works great. But so, <laughs> um, so talk about this notion of like just sort of jailbreaking and, and what, 
um, and, and what role that might play in, in creating a more, you know, repairable ecosystem? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, from the, from a general perspective, right, if you're not familiar with jailbreaking, I kind of think about it as just like bypassing controls of some system to give you access to other resources. And those resources are already available, but not to you, right? So it's something where I think a lot of companies are, are implementing heavy security so they can rely on DMCA and rely on legal action. But if you're buying a product, why should you not be able to gain access to all of the resources? John Deere tractor, which, you know, 5 p.m., right? Stay tuned. Um, it's sort of like if you can't modify your hardware, do you actually own it? And it comes back to all of that. So it really is like, you know, breaking out of a sandbox. Or I thought about today in the shower, like it's not, it's not even a sandbox. It's like a playpen, you know, like they're trying to keep all the children inside and, you know, not, not letting you out to actually use their hardware. But I, I still can I cannot wrap my head around why that shouldn't be, other than the fact that we know they want to, you know, really they want to make a lot of money and they don't want you to use their hardware, so they want you to buy new stuff. Uh, but, you know, it's just, a, it's just another way to make things difficult for us that is not necessary other than they want to make money and they want to maintain control of what people do with their stuff, which is exactly why I think we're at DEF CON to have control of things and break things and make things do things that they weren't intended to. And, and this is just another step in that process. I mean, this affects all different kinds of products. We talk a lot about smartphones. We talk a lot about laptops because those are just things that everybody uses. But it's also home appliances, agricultural equipment, heavy equipment. Can we just talk um, sort of, are there, are there companies, vendors, OEMs that are doing this right? Um, and are there OEMs who are maybe on the road to doing things right? And are there OEMs who are totally lost in the woods on this? Kyle, I, I, I think that's a good question for you. Yeah, well, I mean, the heroes are probably the, the, the startups, the folks like Fairphone out of Netherlands has a uh, super repairable modular phone. Uh, then you have Framework with, uh, anyone Framework customers here? No, awesome yeah. in the back. Yeah. Uh, oh, check out Framework laptop. Yeah. <laughs> framework is killer. Uh, what I love about Framework, I mean, amongst other things, is super modular, modular ports, everything else. But you can, if you upgrade the laptop, you take your board out of your old laptop, put the new board in, and then the board that you upgraded is a full-blown standalone PC. You could 3D print a case and use it as, a, as another computer. Uh, this, this, if, computers are modular. Why the hell aren't we doing this all the time? So uh, you have startups, that, you know, paving the path, but now as, as right to repair laws are, are starting to get passed, you're, we are starting to see some companies uh, come to us. So, so far this year, I fixed those launch partnerships with Microsoft, uh, with uh, Google, and with Samsung, where we're, and, and Valve with, with the Steam Deck, uh, which is probably the most important one, um, uh, where, where we're distributing parts for them. So um, it, we're starting to see movement, uh, but we have to get this from the fringe to mainstream, and having some of these large manufacturers very grudgingly uh, come on board and start to work with us is important. Corinne, I mean, one of the things that, that companies are doing a lot now is like things like, um, you know, putting, putting little uh, um, like trademarks or, or um, logos on even really tiny parts, right, so that they can, so, to the point about counterfeit parts versus authentic parts and whatever, talk about how they're really trying to sort of frustrate the repair, the aftermarket ecosystem for parts um, around, uh, you know, what you need to do repair, like, and, and what the legal theory behind that is. Yeah, so it's a long-standing practice um, from sort of the creative industries, you know, the traditional um, Hollywood copyright industries, to sort of if you can't get it via copyright, see what you can get via trademark. And the good thing about trademarks is they last forever. As long as you maintain them, as long as you're using the mark in connection with whatever the good is in commerce, um, there's no term. Like, as you all probably know, the copyright term limit is ridiculous anyway, because um, it can be up to 90 years. But trademark, Coca-Cola's had trademarks for 120 years now. because They're maintaining it. Maybe I'm close to 120. So, um, so, so the idea is, yeah, okay, well, maybe copyright isn't completely helping us. But if we put our trademark on every single little bitty thing, um, then we can go after um, folks who might be providing an alternative, um, but maybe are also using the work or are using, using the um, object in a way that we didn't authorize. And then we can say, okay, well, that is a trademark violation. You are, because um, we have the right 
to control the use of our mark and how it's used. And so you can kind of sort of use it downstream. Um, or you can go after people who are trying to resell those parts, who have managed to like break things apart and they want to sell it on eBay or whatever. And then so they'll um, go and go after them and say, you know, you're not an authorized seller of this good. And so, um, and they'll shut you down. And the thing about it that is worth thinking about is because very often a lot of this doesn't happen like one-to-one, -one, but rather via platforms. So if you're making, you know, parts available, maybe you make it available on eBay. Well, then all they're going to, they're going to talk to you. Why are they going to talk to you? That's too much trouble. They're just going to send a note to eBay and eBay will take it down. Uh, will you know, take down the shop or Etsy or whatever. Like it's, it's a way of bypassing actually trying to go after the individual directly. You go after the platform who is much more vulnerable and less interested probably in defending any given seller than, um, than, than anyway, because the seller is probably not giving them very much money, right? They want to preserve their entire platform and they don't want to get in litigation. So it's just better to take it down. If you open an iPhone or if you look at one of uh, iFixit's teardowns, you'll see just about every part inside the iPhone has the Apple logo on it. And I, I met some engineers who had worked on iPhone, uh, you know, were out of their seven year NDA and I was like, why do you guys do that? Is there any engineering, is there any supply chain reason for that? And he said, I have no idea why. Well, I'll tell you, the reason why is to make it difficult for people like Lewis and I to get parts across borders. Uh, the presumption at US Customs is that you are guilty until proven innocent and you have to show that you have permission from the trademark holder to be moving that trademark across the border. Uh, so when they when they put the Apple logo on a flex on the display, how does that limit you? So let's say somebody buys an iPhone in China. They t take all the parts of that legally purchased iPhone in China, and then they sell them to s separately to someone in America. That they will be seized because they'll say that all of those parts were counterfeit because it has an Apple logo on it. And since you're not on the list of people that should be getting those parts, then surely that must mean that it is counterfeit. It's assumed counterfeit unless you ha are on that particular list. So even if I'm importing parts that are either, whether they're used or they came from an actual device that somebody bought in that country that they're parting out for profit, you can't import them. They have to find a way to grind the logo off of it. And if they don't grind the logo off of it, then you wind up getting in trouble. This is in a particular problem when you're talking about something like a display assembly where they grind the logo into the back of the case. So so that you're not able to actually import it. So you usually wind up having to make the package so annoying that they just don't open it to see what the logo is. And you know, you'll see, like you, you probably get packages like this where it's been taped over and has 10 or 20 layers of cardboard. They'll be, my, my personal favorite was when they actually shipped me display assemblies. What they did is they put it in, so they, they put them inside of laptop coolers. So they had these laptop coolers, little fans that you put onto the laptop. They broke it, they broke the fan blades and they put my parts inside of it. You just find all these ridiculously creative ways to get around customs and it's not that hard. I mean, it's kind of like getting something past the TSA, which is, you know, fairly simple. If <laughs> Corinne, how can they do that? Like how, why is customs and border protection, why is customs and border protection in the, in the business of helping Apple to suppress, you know, the, the total legal movement of, of aftermarket parts? Federal jobs program. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> well, actually, I, you'd be, shocked how much federal money is and resources are spent policing IP um, when you think they should be doing something else. And really you think Homeland Security, what does that have to do with anything? Homeland Security is seizing websites. I mean, that are involved in copyright infringement. Like this is because they're under tremendous pressure from major IP owners to be engaging this kind of activity. And you know, they're responsive to that because what will happen is IP owners will come to them and say, like, you have no idea that the piracy, the, the, the counter, the, the fraud, it's like you have to protect consumers. And the, the argument will be, you are protecting consumers from getting counterfeit parts. You're con protecting consumers from accessing pirate sites, not realizing it. You're protected. Like, that will be the idea. You are protecting the security of Americans. And I do think most of us, when we think of Department of Homeland Security, we actually don't think that's what they're doing with their time. And also when we think of the Customs and Border uh, Enforcement, I mean, yeah, they are going to police counterfeits across the border. That's not a crazy thing for them to do. It's just perhaps, you know. Gone a little too far. Maybe gone a little too far, maybe priorities. And, and they, I mean, Customs is a thing where you, you, as a big company, you can pay Customs money to pay for their staff to do their enforcement. It's very convenient if you have buckets of money. Okay, final question, and I want to go to some questions from the audience. Um, and this, I think Joe, Kyle, 
Lewis, probably um, good question for you. How do we um, how do we promote this? Uh, not only you know right to repair. So yes, right pr promote you know right to repair laws get them passed. But kind of what Kyle was talking about, this idea, and Joe, that you talk about a lot, of getting people to start thinking about their devices in a different way, not being afraid to open them up, not buying the lie like it's cheaper to just replace it, it's cheaper to just replace it, and actually kind of start thinking about these as things that they own and things that they have the right and the ability to fix themselves or get a neighbor to fix or get Lewis to fix. I mean, I think, you know, what Lewis is, is doing and what Kyle is doing are sort of the, the main kind of things of getting people to realize, oh, you can fix stuff. Like, I, you know, ever since being a kid, like most of us want to open stuff up and see how it works, but not everybody does that. Most people buy a device, they take it for granted and say, oh, some magical engineers created this thing, it's perfect. Um, and not realizing they can open it up. And of course, when vendors are making things harder to open and they add all sorts of problems from a trademark perspective or anti-tamper mechanisms to make it you know, self-destruct or delete something when you open it, like, there's all these things that prevent us from, from doing it. But it, it, again, it all comes down to profit and control and I think really spreading the message to people of like, look, you can open stuff, you can modify stuff, you shouldn't have to go to Shenzhen to like find components that you can bring back. You know, if you've seen um, Strange Parts YouTube channel, uh, you know, there, there's people repairing things and modifying things, but it shouldn't be this difficult to do. Like, Lewis shouldn't have to have people smuggle parts through. It should be as accessible to us as it is to other people. When I'm talking about Shenzhen, I was there, and if you've ever go, you know, if you ever can go to like the SEG market, and Bunny Wang has written about this a lot, and you go, and it's floors and floors and floors of different components for different projects and the, the repair culture is a lot different there and the, the access to information and information sharing is a lot different there. And I, I kind of put it on myself. I showed up, I had like 90 minutes and I wanted to see could I find schematics for like an iPhone because I had heard you could do it. And through talking to different people at different booths or like talk to this person, talk to this person. I had my iPhone trying to translate because even the, the Chinese word for schematics is not schematic. It's like, you know, visual drawing of something. So I ended up going through and finding books of schematics uh, that had, you know, confidential information, blah, blah, blah. But either somebody had taken those out of the factory or they'd reverse engineered the board, but it shouldn't be that hard, right? And like, I finally got them and, and I guess technically smuggled them over the border and brought them back to the U.S. Um, but why? Like most people are not going to be able to do that. So they're going to rely on Lewis and iFixit and other companies. Like iFixit shouldn't have to reverse engineer old Toshiba laptops to make their own manuals. That's just ridiculous. So the whole thing is just mind boggling. Um, but I, I think it all sort of boils down to why we're hackers in the first place and why we're here is to like educate people and push against corporations that are trying to do something, uh, you know, to make the world a, a place that's better for them than it is for us. Lewis, Carl, anything to add? I think it comes down to getting people personally invested in it. You know, there's, I think that there's two different types of activism. There's the Greta Thunberg type of activism with the how dare you, which results in more Ford F-350 diesels rolling coal on my electric car when I run through Pennsylvania than ever before. And then there's the type where you try to get people personally invested. So, you know, what, what a part of what I tried to do with my YouTube channel is turn it into a little bit of performance art, like Mr. Rogers or Bob Ross. You know, when I started posting repair videos to YouTube, I was looking for them myself and they would always be 90 seconds, have techno music playing, super fast, very boring, just kind of there's no, you know, there's no soul, nothing fun about it. So I would try to make these little nine to 15 minute clips where it seemed interesting. We explained the entire concept in a way that a seventh grader could understand. We would go through every single thing that we did. We try to make it a little bit interesting, talk about current events while we're doing it and also not leave anything out. So when I say make it, get people personally invested, I mean also do it in a way that is profitable. Somebody who watches this stuff could start charging two or $300 for 15 minutes of their time to do those, that type of work themselves, or they could use that to fix their own device and save a few thousand bucks. And once you've saved somebody a thousand bucks, they're personally invested. Or once you see, once somebody is actually watching going, this is kind of entertaining, this is kind of cool. And they watch a hundred of those videos and then I say, by the way, this, these may no longer exist because the company is taking away, away our ability to do that. You've kind of, uh, gotten their personal investment. You said th this is what is going to be taken away. You're going to stop being able to enjoy this if this goes away. So I think you have to get people as personally invested as humanly possible. And that starts by allowing them to save money, allowing them to make money, and allowing them to be entertained through sharing your passion. And I think that that's something that 
is more going to be on the cultural side than the legal side. Like I do a lot for right to repair on the legal side, but at the end of the day, a right to repair bill gets released that says make things available. Samsung tells Kyle, well, we're going to give you $213 batteries welded to the screen. Like there's an element of malicious compliance that it's always going to be there. And getting people personally invested in all of this so that companies like Framework exist and are actually economically viable. People want to buy that because they value repairability to the point where they can actually make schematics available for their products and parts and everything else. That's what's going to be what I think what moves this forward. Well I think also the, the amount of views on your channel sort of validates the fact that people mm -hmm. want to fix their own stuff, right? It's like that's, that's what the companies are afraid of because if they're going to lose money on their authorized dealerships or whatever, it, it, it only proves the point. that Or watch empty real stuff. estate. What's that? Or watch empty real estate. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Can I have one more thing? Of course. So um, one of the things that we talk about a lot at EFF is um, sometimes you have a need to speak tech to power. And what that means, and it's kind of what I think um, Lewis did to some extent, like there are times, at the, particularly at the state level, where what we need is for someone to come and testify or even just talk to their local assembly person, which most people don't do and kind of don't want to do and I don't blame them. <laughs> I understand it's not that fun. But sometimes that's really what's needed is for us to have a technologist on the ground who can go and just talk to their representative and say, I'm going to tell you the truth because I know it and this is my profession and this is what I do. And it's actually amazing to me how responsive, especially at the local level, um, that folks can be because they want, they, they don't hear from that many people. And to be honest, they hear also from some crazy people and then they hear from a bunch of really expensive corporate lobbyists who are yeah. really good at talking. Yeah. And uh, despite the mumble mumble crazy that we heard earlier, <laughs> but actually they're pretty good at it and they give them money. So speaking tech to power, um, is actually a place where the people in this community can be really effective. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that struck me in this whole process is how, when you go in and, and talk to legislators, you know, they're definitely open to hearing your opinion, but you also get a real sense of how much their day-to-day -day is occupied by lobbyists, lawyers, PR people working on behalf of moneyed interests, whether those are specific corporations, industry groups, what have you. Like, those people... Are there outside the John when they come out to like talk to them on their way back to their office? They're there, you know, taking them out to lunch. And that has an impact. And you, you know, we have lives, we have work, we can't hang around state houses and lobby. So we do need to work collectively. Um, yes, Joe. I'm curious about something. Are there, is there anybody in the audience that works at a, at a product vendor, you know, somebody that's designing products and selling them? So maybe doesn't have a, you don't have to say if you have an opinion about right to repair, but working from that side, like actually as a consumer product vendor or anything. Yeah, there's a couple. So there's, um, there's, there's something that came to mind. So Crowd Supply is a, is a website, you know, promoting open hardware development and crowdfunding. And they have something called the Proclamation of User Rights that not only are they just going to take any project, like say a Kickstarter might or Indiegogo, um, they have a list of like certain things that protect user rights. So... You know, I have it on here like curiosity and independence and association and longevity and transfer and discourse and privacy and security. And if you're from those worlds of, of product development, like you should take a look at that list of user rights. And I think it's really interesting if uh, besides talking to the lobbyists, like working within the organization and saying, look, this is how products should be designed. Like we can still make a profit selling our product, but if we follow these rules, like framework and like some of the projects that Bunny Wang are working on and you know there's all of these smaller projects but if, if, if this type of mindset can go into real company consumer design like that would be amazing and then it's sort of it, it's, it's for the people right and like I think they, CrowdSupply did a really good job of sort of explaining these different steps so even using that as a resource or like a starting point maybe I have no idea because I'm not in that world but maybe that's something that is worth trying to you know start Kyle's, conversations Kyle's going to have something to say on this I think yeah I mean it, <laughs> and, and I fix it we're doing a lot of that we, we do a lot of you know consulting and work with companies there's a lot of the, we're starting to see the pendulum swing and so there's a lot of interest how do I design repairable products how do I design safe replaceable batteries what does it look like to set up a part supply chain? Uh, we're at the beginning of that. We need a lot more. So as you are talking with your friends that work in engineering at these companies, like this can be done, uh, the, it, right? We can design repairable long-lasting hardware. We just have to decide to do it. We have to make the case to management. And so that's what I spend a lot of my time doing.
doing is making the case that either the sustainability folks or the security folks or the engineers want helping them figure out how to make the case to management to actually shift business practices. Well, it's sort of like coming back around to how it was in the 70s and 80s where you would buy something and yeah. you get your schematic and your, you know, Apple, the first Apple, Right. Two had schematics and yeah. you could buy prototype default. boards and the, it was the, it was default. the default and right. it was just the way everything was done uh, at the beginning of the electronics era we have lost our way now we have to argue our way back onto right. straight and narrow path yes and legislate our way back okay are there questions from the audience for our panel oh great um, we'll start there and then yeah. a front row green shirt uh <clears throat> I'm a father, and uh, I learned how to get curious by taking stuff apart. My grandfather had like the uh, the old tubes uh, uh, television, and uh, he taught me how to tear stuff apart. And I took that on to my kids, and they became curious about technology. If I walk around at the schools, I see consumers. So consumers are being created instead of creators. And I think as a community, we have like, we need to uh, keep uh, kids curious by taking stuff apart. Don't be afraid of technology because it helps them think about s certain issues. But it's also uh, like we're saving the planet by uh, allowing this to, uh, yeah, change uh, as a community so if you can inspire someone do like classes on school uh, uh, help inspire others that really helps yeah and, and those are the next generation of, of kids that might turn into engineers that then work in the companies and have that mindset not the closed mindset but the open mindset so that's hugely important exactly and there's like so many people required in the uh, uh, in the, the industry can we do yeah third row and then um, just move back that'd be great That's the fourth row, but okay. Um, hello. Um, I'm hoping you can connect some dots here because the, the problems that Right to Repair seems to face, you listed was like end user license agreements, um, customs, DRM, um, exclusivity agreements, and the legislation I've seen so far only seems to tackle maybe one of those. Um, is there any? Like, what legislative solutions are we looking at for, especially like EULAs? I'm sorry, I want to make sure I understand the question. Is it so? What legislative solutions are we seeing to the various um, legal impediments? Yeah, the because the, the legislation I've seen so far or that you've been advocating for um, only seems to say you know we need to make manuals available and things like that. I'm not sure how that really solves some of the problems that we've had for so long, especially with um, like EULAs where they, yeah. I shouldn't have to really agree to an EULA to receive it and use it. Yeah, so, um, so there's a couple things um, in play. So you're quite right that the state right to repair laws, um, they're great, they don't do everything, there's way more to be done, but it's a start. Um, there is, in fact... Oh, 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 oh. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Okay. There is um, a long-standing um, bill that's been in Congress that was introduced by um, Representative Zoe Lofgren that would change um, Section 1201 at least so that if you are circumventing, if you're breaking the lock in order to d make a fair use, to do something that's otherwise lawful, then um, then it will be lawful. And that would, ascend, that would be tremendous. Um, unfortunately, there's very, very strong opposition to that, but um, that would be tremendous. We really need some solutions at the federal level. Um, the, but unfortunately, courts have over and over treated end user license agreements like regular negotiated contracts and treated them as equally binding to regularly negotiate a contract. And that's ridiculous and um, there's more and more folks who are talking about it but that's a thing that's also going to have to it's going to take some action at the state level because contract law is state law um, so so yeah so there's not I, I I that's why I'm actually mostly hopeful that we get rid of section 1201 anyway in court rather than having to rely on Congress because courts are slow Congress is slower I, and I would call on all of you. If there's something that bothers you, like I'm just a guy who decided I cared about repair and spent a while advocating for this, right? Lewis started a YouTube channel. Uh, we're just, 
we're just normal people. We're just like the rest of you. So if you if something bothers you, if if you want to take on the EULA issue, it's a major major issue. Uh, we need more people working on this. There are not enough people in the public advocacy space working to counteract um, these highly paid corporate and, lobbies. And to the question on the right to repair laws, it's a little bit, um, it, it's not just about the repair manuals. They also say that you have to provide access to diagnostic software, and they also say that you need to provide tools to unlock um, digital locks for the purposes of doing repair. So it isn't just, oh, well, you'll get the manual, but you're still screwed. So they, it's, it's, they're, more, they're more granular than that. Yeah, the, the state law is basically give or sell me the tool. The federal law that we're working on is make it legal for me to whittle my own tool. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where the mic guy is. Where's the mic okay, guy? I've got it here. Okay, there we go. Um, really interesting that you mentioned um, Harley Davidson because my motorcycle is in the shop right now because I tried to tune it and now they've refused to fix the motorcycle. It's not even a warranty issue. They won't even allow me to pay for a new thing or fix it. They said, oh, you broke it. So we'll no longer fix it. How does how do I go about working with Harley Davidson or whatever to say you know you, this is not legal or you know <laughs> what are the laws that could protect me in the state of California? Don't go alone. I think that's exactly. probably one. Yeah, <laughs> bring some muscle. Yeah, I mean we we need we need them to be sharing their diagnostic software so at least you've got an even shot at what the dealership is going to do. And that's where like the Massachusetts uh, existing right to repair law and then the updated one that's currently being challenged in courts, that, that will help. I, does it apply to motorcycles? I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think it, I I think it does. We should. I, I believe it does, yeah. Um, but but that, that, that's the right, the right strategy. It's at least to get you on an even keel with the dealership so that you can maybe use their tooling. I would mention from a security perspective, once we do have access to their tooling, that's a whole other attack service we can investigate. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So I expect, expect as right to repair starts to become out there and companies are posting diagnostic software, you may see some on iFixit soon. Uh, that's going to be interesting bites to look at. Yes. No more security through obscurity. Yes. Uh, okay, go ahead. Just to recast the question so you can all hear, he said, yeah, we're a hardware vendor and uh, the product that we sell is regulated. We have to have tamper-proof mechanisms on the product in order to sell it. Uh, what's your kind of take on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're following FIPS 140, which basically is a checklist of things you need to do to, to be physically secure or be secure, which is anti-tamper mechanisms to prevent physical access. Um, Maybe you know encryption of data and things and things like that. I I don't know. I mean, you know, from my perspective of being a hacker, when I see a product that's FIPS 140 compliant, I say, okay, at least they've maybe tried to take some steps, but I still am going to try to hack it. Right. Yeah. A lot of it's security by obscurity, and a lot of it is checklists of things. Um, I think. Yeah. If you're like un because of those things, are you now preventing right to repair in a way that you would prefer to? enable that but you can't like I, I don't know right to repair laws really don't deal with design at all all they're saying if you're a hardware if you're a security vendor you've got an authorized repair provider who you send your gear to and you provide them with tools and information to do those repairs on your behalf all repairs it does nothing to do with how you design your product all it's saying is you need to make those tools available to your own to the customers themselves and to independent repair so that they can so that there can be a competitive market for that service and whether it's FIPS compliant or not, I think the right to repair laws are totally silent on that. It, but if you've got an authorized repair infra, you know, system, you know, network, they're saying you need to open that up. I know Lewis and Kyle did good work uh, advocating for the New York State right to repair law. Last I checked, that passed the legislator and is waiting for Hochul signature. Is there anything else holding that up? No, email uh, Kathy Hochul. Email the governor. The governor, Kathy Hochul, it's sitting on her desk. She just needs to sign it. Indications are that she will, but I think uh, requests, you know, like 
friendly suggestions or yes. requests that she sign that would be would be welcome. Yes. Uh, but I can say we're actively working on it. Uh, right, uh, the Repair.org is the Right to Repair Coalition working on this. Please join Repair.org. Um, uh, we we met with the governor's staff this week and uh, we're continuing that dialogue. So we're hopeful. Um, you say, well, why hasn't she done it yet? New York passed a thousand bills this year. <laughs> she has to sign all of them by hand. Uh, so that takes some time. I think we got time maybe for one more question. Yeah. So hypothetically, if members of the audience were, let's say, involved with some consortiums of hospitals that were fighting against some particularly evil and litigious OEMs on right to repair, how might they get more collaborative with those of you at, up at the, on the panel and work together on some of these issues? Come up and talk to me after. Uh, we're, we're very interested. We're working with hospitals. We have medical focused right to repair uh, tests. One thing, by the way, I want to mention, since uh, the other panel that's happening right now is talking about, about medical, but uh, when COVID started, um, we started collaborating with EFF and we said, look, there's all these service manuals for hospital equipment that should be out there. Biomeds are handing them around on hard drives and USB sticks to get the service manuals around. Can we just get those on the internet? <laughs> I talked to Craig, I was like, you know, do you think you guys can, can back us up if, if we stick our neck out a little bit on this? And, and she said, yes. And so we did it. And so we launched the On I Fix It. We got 300 archivists and librarians that have been sent home during COVID to help us comb through. And we got 25,000 service manuals, PDFs for everything from a, a ventilator to a CPAP machine to, you know, hospital equipment, vital sign monitors, you name it. It's all on iFixit.com. It's all free. It's all, uh, it, 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 and it, uh, so I would encourage, I hope that's a useful resource. Also, if you're looking to do security research on these things, the service man is a good place to start. Yes. So hopefully that helps. But yeah, we're working actively with hospitals around the country and we'd love to talk. Do we have time for one more question or not? Yes? Uh, over here? Over here? Yeah, right. That, he's, he's got his hand very high up. So I want to... <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, I, I was just curious... There's a lot of talk about right to repair, and, and Louis Ross, Mark Rossman, you're a, a hero of mine. Um, I was curious if, if you had any thoughts on uh, focusing more on kind of removing these unelected bureaucrats, like in, in customs, like kind of reducing their powers, focusing on that, uh, having Congress act on, on that in particular, removing powers where they don't need to be. I definitely wouldn't be opposed to it. Um, TSA while we're at it as well. Why not? Uh, it's Beautiful. <laughs> okay. Uh, give a big hand to our panelists. They did an amazing job. And thanks all of you for coming and, and asking great questions.